As I stepped through the door, the familiar comfort of home was immediately overshadowed by an unsettling sight. There, on the dining room table, which usually hosted family dinners and cheerful conversations, lay a collection of feminine items, two pairs of Mary Jane shoes, one black, the other red, and a small black purse. These weren't just any items. They were secrets I had hoped to keep hidden, secrets now laid bare under the unyielding gaze of my mother, sister, and cousin. Their eyes turned towards me, a mix of curiosity and disbelief etching their faces. Guess what we found in your room, my sister teased, a sly grin tugging at her lips. The weight of their stares felt like a vice around my chest, squeezing tighter with every second I stood there. I tried to muster any shred of defiance I could find within myself. I really don't know what you ladies found and I couldn't care less, I blurted out, hoping my feigned indifference might diffuse the situation. For a moment, it seemed to work. They exchanged glances, momentarily unsure how to proceed. But as I attempted to brush past them to the sanctuary of my room, my mother's voice, gentle yet firm, stopped me. Just a minute, dear, she said, her eyes locking onto mine with an intensity that I knew meant she wouldn't be brushed off so easily. We still want to know why you have these pretty things. Caught in the lie and with nowhere to escape, I felt my face flush with heat. The black shoes and the handbag. I had taken them from my sister about a year ago. And the red ones? They were a more recent acquisition from my cousin's collection, snatched just yesterday. I had planned to sneak them back before her visit ended, a plan clearly foiled. Did you wear them, Pumpkin? My mom asked a softness in her voice that somehow felt more daunting than any anger or disappointment she could have shown. It was the kind of tone that expected honesty, that deserved honesty. No! I shot back too quickly, too sharply. The word hung heavily in the air and I turned abruptly, retreating to my room. I could hear their whispers as I left, a chaotic melody of confusion and concern that I couldn't bear to face. Sitting on my bed, the walls of my room felt closer than before, the secrets I held now spilling out beyond my control. My heart raced as I heard footsteps approaching. The door opened, and there was my mom, holding the red shoes and a few other items. Her approach was gentle, but her intent was clear. Well, Pumpkin, I for one want to see how you look in these, she declared, her voice a mixture of warmth and resolve. Mom, no, I don't want to wear them in front of you, I pleaded the words barely escaping my lips before she responded with a smile that seemed to know no boundaries. You will wear them, not only in front of me, but in front of Denise and Shelley too, she continued, the inevitable hanging over me like a heavy curtain about to drop. As she laid out the clothes on my bed, a pair of white nylon panties and pantyhose among them, I realized that this was no longer just about the clothes. It was about me, about who I was, and the terrifying journey of discovery I was about to embark on with the most unlikely companions. My family. There was no way around it. The clothes lay spread out on my bed like a challenge I couldn't refuse. My mother's insistence had a playful tone, but beneath it was a firm expectation that I could not ignore. With my heart pounding and a storm of emotions swirling inside me, I realized that there was no escape from this impending moment of exposure. Come on, it'll be fun, my mother encouraged as she held up the pantyhose, her smile trying to ease the tension, but every fiber of my being resisted. My hands trembled slightly as I took them from her, the smooth, stretchy fabric cold and alien in my unsure grip. It's just us, she added, a gentle nudge in her voice, as if that simplicity could soften the complexity of my feelings. Reluctantly, I began to dress each piece of clothing adding weight to the emotional burden I felt. The pantyhose were first, an unfamiliar sensation that pulled tight across my legs. Then the skirt, its fabric brushing against my thighs in a whisper of betrayal to my own identity. I stood awkwardly, the skirt sitting around my waist, feeling more exposed than I had ever been. My mother's eyes watched with a mix of curiosity and something else, perhaps a hint of understanding that I couldn't yet fathom. She helped me with the buckles of the shoes, her hands steady and reassuring in a way that contrasted sharply with the turmoil inside me. Look at you, her voice chimed, filled with an enthusiasm I couldn't share. Denise and Shelley joined in, their giggles piercing the heavy air around me. 
Isn't he adorable? Shelley exclaimed, clapping her hands delightfully. Denise nodded, adding, You look so cute. But their words felt like thorns, each compliment a twist of the knife of my humiliation. I stood there, dressed in a reality I had never imagined sharing with anyone, let alone my family. The mirror before me reflected a stranger, someone caught between worlds, neither fully one thing nor the other. As I met my own gaze in the mirror, the discomfort was palpable. My cheeks burned with a mix of shame and anger. Why did they find this amusing? Was this really just fun for them? The room felt smaller, the air thicker. I wanted to tear away the clothes, to shout, to make them see that this wasn't just a simple game to me. Yet, beneath the embarrassment and confusion, a tiny, unfamiliar part of me was curious about the person staring back at me in the mirror. The clothes felt foreign, but they also unleashed a cascade of questions about myself that I had never dared to ask. My mother's hand rested gently on my shoulder, her presence a silent offer of solidarity that I wasn't sure I wanted or could understand. We're just having a bit of fun, she reiterated, her voice a soft coo that seemed to dance around the truth we both felt but didn't fully understand. As the minutes stretched into what felt like hours, the initial shock began to wane, replaced by a complex cocktail of emotions. Resentment mixed with an unexpected, unsettling sense of revelation about who I might be beyond the confines of expected norms. The air was chilly as we stepped out of the house, but the coldness I felt came more from the fear of exposure than from the weather itself. The drive to the mall was silent on my part, my mind racing with thoughts of what was to come. My mother, ever the orchestrator of this surreal day, chatted lightly, perhaps in an attempt to normalize what felt like an extraordinarily abnormal situation to me. As we parked and walked towards the bustling entrance of the mall, the reality of what was happening hit me with full force. My heart thudded painfully against my ribs, each beat a drum of impending doom. The mall, a place I had often frequented as just another teenager, now felt like an arena where I was the unwilling gladiator. The sliding doors parted, and we stepped into the cacophony of weekend shoppers. The air was thick with the scent of perfume samples and fast food, a blend as intoxicating as it was nauseating under my nervous condition. My sister grabbed my hand, pulling me excitedly toward the first store, a popular spot for trendy teenage attire. Come on, we'll find you something cute to wear, she chirped seemingly oblivious to the storm of embarrassment brewing inside me. The store was a kaleidoscope of colors and fabrics, each article of clothing another layer of disguise I was being forced to don. My mother and sister flitted from rack to rack, holding up skirts and blouses, debating over what would look best on me. The sales associates, young women not much older than myself, watched with a mixture of curiosity and amusement. One approached, her smile polite yet edged with a hint of confusion. Finding everything okay? She asked, her eyes flickering briefly to my awkward stance in the aisle. Yes, thank you, my mother answered for me, her voice bright. We're just trying to find something special for my... for our day out. The way she stumbled over the words, delicately avoiding pronouns, only deepened my blush. As they selected a dress a soft, floral thing that felt like a flag of surrender. I was coaxed into the fitting room. The curtain drew with a swish, a flimsy barrier between me and the bustling store. Slipping into the dress, I felt every thread against my skin, each one a reminder of how far I was from myself. Stepping out to show them, I met my own eyes in the mirror. The person staring back seemed both familiar and utterly strange. My cousin, who had been quiet up to now, gave a low whistle. Look at you, you could totally pass, she exclaimed, a note of genuine surprise in her voice. The attention was too much, a spotlight I couldn't escape. We moved through the mall like that, store to store, each step heavier than the last. Laughter and chatter surrounded us, the mundane joys of weekend shopping that felt so out of reach for me. At each store, the ritual was the same. Dresses, skirts, shoes, each piece added to the persona I was being forced to adopt. My family's delight at each successful outfit contrasted sharply with the tightness in my chest. They saw a game, a novelty. 
I felt the erasure of my identity, one piece of clothing at a time. Yet, amidst the whirlwind of fabric and fittings, a strange sensation began to creep over me. It wasn't acceptance but a flicker of curiosity about the boundaries of identity, about who I could be in a world less rigid. It was a small comfort, a quiet voice amidst the roar of my turmoil. But as we left the mall, bags in hand, that voice was drowned out once again by the fear of what lay ahead. The public had seen me, not as I am, but as I was made to appear. And for now, that distinction was a gulf too wide to bridge. As we navigated through the crowded mall, weaving between groups of excited shoppers and distracted teens, the reality of my situation became even more intense. The atmosphere was thick with the noise of chatter and laughter, background music from each store adding to the cacophony. It felt like every step took me deeper into a world where I didn't belong. Turning a corner, we came across a group of boys from my school, lounging near the food court. My stomach churned as I recognized them, their familiar faces now potential threats to my carefully maintained secret. They were a usual sight in this part of the mall, a reminder of my normal life, which seemed so distant now. As we approached, I could feel their eyes on us, or more precisely, on me. The air felt heavier, thick with my anxiety. My sister, seemingly oblivious to my discomfort, steered us directly towards them. Hey guys, she called out cheerfully, waving as we got closer. Hey Shelly, who's your friend? One of them asked, eyeing me with a mix of curiosity and confusion. His words felt like ice down my spine, a moment of truth that I wasn't prepared to face. This is... Denise. My cousin jumped in quickly, giving me a fictitious name, her voice a little too enthusiastic. I forced a smile, my heart pounding as I nodded in greeting, hoping my minimal interaction would pass without suspicion. The boys looked at me, their expressions a mix of intrigue and skepticism. Nice to meet you, Denise, another boy said, his tone friendly but guarded. I could sense them trying to place me, their minds likely scrolling through mental images of girls they knew, trying to match a face to the name. We didn't stop to chat, thankfully. My sister pulled us along, her grip firm on my arm as we continued our path through the mall. But even as we moved away, I could feel their stares on my back, their whispered speculations like whispers of wind that I couldn't escape. As we walked, the interactions didn't end there. We bumped into more acquaintances, casual friends of my sister and cousin, each encounter a minefield I navigated with feigned indifference and silent prayers that they wouldn't see through the disguise. Each conversation was a balancing act, where I had to keep my voice just soft enough and my words just vague enough to avoid detection. Despite my efforts, I could feel the facade cracking slightly with every passing moment. The way I held myself, the careful steps in unfamiliar shoes, the slight stiffness when I moved. All these tiny details felt like glaring signs to me, though no one seemed to outright question them. Amongst this social ballet, a particularly painful moment came when a group of girls from my class spotted us. They rushed over, the familiarity of their approach a stark contrast to the distance I now felt. Denise, love your outfit, one of them complimented, her smile friendly and open. Thanks. I managed to reply, the word feeling foreign on my tongue. Their easy chatter, discussions of school events and weekend plans, swirled around me. I stood there, part of the circle but a part in every way that mattered, a spectator in a life that was no longer entirely mine. This ongoing act, maintaining a facade among those who knew me in a different light, was exhausting. With each interaction, I felt a part of me retreat further, shielding myself from the potential fallout of this day. The discomfort of the clothes was nothing compared to the discomfort within my own skin, as I played a role that felt both alien and revealing in ways I hadn't anticipated. The constant buzz of the mall felt like it was closing in on me, each step a reminder of the precarious balance I was maintaining. But nothing could have prepared me for the moment when I saw her, Annie, my girlfriend, coming around the corner with her group of friends. My heart stopped, caught between fear and an inexplicable hope. As she spotted us, her pace quickened, and her usual bright smile spread across her face. The closer she got, the tighter my chest felt, bracing for her reaction, for the shock or confusion, 
or worse, the end of something dear to me. But as her eyes met mine, dressed not as the boyfriend she knew but as someone entirely different, her smile didn't falter. Instead, something in her eyes lit up with an unexpected warmth and understanding. Denise, right? She played along seamlessly, winking at me discreetly as she joined our group. Her friends, a little bewildered, followed her lead, accepting the introduction without question. It was a surreal moment, watching Annie adapt to the situation with such grace and ease. Wow, I love this look on you, Annie whispered to me, her voice low enough that only I could hear. It's different, but it suits you in a way I didn't expect. Her words, meant to comfort, did soothe some part of my frayed nerves, but they also deepened the whirlpool of emotions inside me. We all moved to a quieter part of the mall, a bench near one of the large windows overlooking the parking lot. Annie sat next to me, her presence a calming force amidst the storm that had been my day. Her friends, curious but respectful, chatted among themselves, allowing us a moment of semi-privacy. I mean it, Annie continued, her hand finding mine and squeezing gently. I think it's brave what you're doing. And if this is a part of who you are or even just something you're exploring, I want to support you. Her sincerity shone through, her eyes searching mine for any sign of the anxiety that was indeed racing through my mind. The acceptance and support from Annie were overwhelming. Here was someone who saw me in a completely unexpected and vulnerable situation and chose to offer kindness and acceptance rather than judgment. This gesture of hers, simple yet profound, helped steady the chaos within me. Her encouragement didn't just make the situation easier, it shifted something fundamental between us. Thank you, Annie, I managed to say, my voice thick with emotion. I was so scared of how you'd react. I'm here for you, she said firmly, no matter what. And hey, maybe we can have some fun with this too. There are a few stores I think you'll love. As the day wore on, Annie took the lead, her enthusiasm infectious. She guided me through different stores, helping me choose items that she thought I would like, not just things that would disguise me. With each passing hour, the weight of the day seemed to lighten slightly, buoyed by her acceptance and the new playful complicity in our relationship. Her friends, catching on to her cues, began to include me more openly, discussing styles, colors, and even makeup tips. Their acceptance, following Annie's lead, was a balm to the raw edges of my day. The mall, once a battlefield, slowly transformed into a playground of sorts, a place of exploration and laughter, tinged with the normalcy of teenage shopping but layered with deeper meanings and discoveries. As we finally left the mall, bags in hand, a new kind of connection had formed, not just between Annie and me, but also within myself, a connection to a perhaps previously unacknowledged part of my identity. Annie's support was not just about acceptance, it was a promise of companionship through whatever lay ahead, and with it, a new chapter of my life was beginning to unfold. The newfound support from Annie brought an unexpected shift in my life. With her encouragement, the boundaries that had once seemed so fixed began to blur. I found myself navigating a dual existence, stepping into a world that was both exhilarating and daunting. Sunday morning arrived with a gentle sunlight filtering through my curtains. The day of my first public outing, not just in the safe confines of the mall, but in a place where communities converged, the church. The significance of this step wasn't lost on me. It was one thing to experiment with identity among strangers in a mall, quite another to do so in a familiar communal setting. Annie was there at my side, as promised, her presence a reassuring constant. She arrived early at my house, her arms laden with a dress she had chosen for me, the print dress with black pumps, echoing our mall adventure but also marking the start of something more profound. Dressing that morning felt different. It wasn't just about putting on an outfit. It was about embracing a part of me that was still unfamiliar, still forming. As I slipped into the dress, the fabric felt like a second skin, a part of a persona that was both me and not me. I looked at myself in the mirror, and for the first time, the reflection seemed to blend seamlessly with how I felt inside. Walking into the church, my heart pounded with a mix of nerves and a strange, burgeoning confidence. 
The whispers were there, soft murmurs of curiosity and perhaps judgment. But Annie squeezed my hand, her small smile telling me everything was okay. The service passed in a blur of hymns and prayers. My mind focused more on the feel of the dress and the occasional glances from familiar faces. But it was after the service, in the social hall, that the real test came. Conversations paused as we approached, cups of coffee mid-sip, the undercurrent of curiosity palpable. Yet, with Annie by my side, introducing me simply as my friend, the initial awkwardness melted away into polite, if somewhat stilted, exchanges. The true challenge, however, came with the prospect of a double date. Annie had arranged for us to go out with one of her friends and her boyfriend. The idea was thrilling, but filled with a complexity that kept my mind racing. How would it be to interact in such an intimate social setting, not as the person they had known, but as this new version of myself? The evening of the double date arrived, and with it a whirlwind of emotions. We met at a quaint local restaurant, its cozy ambiance a soft cushion against my nerves. Introductions were made, and to my relief, the conversation flowed more easily than I had anticipated. Annie's friend, Claire, was open and engaging, treating me no differently than she would any new acquaintance. Her boyfriend, Mark, followed her lead, his polite interest setting the tone for a relaxed evening. Throughout the dinner, I found myself participating more freely, laughing and sharing stories. The more we talked, the more the initial awkwardness faded, replaced by a genuine connection. It was a revelation, a glimpse of what life could be like if I allowed myself to fully embrace this dual existence. As the evening drew to a close, Annie and I walked back to her car, the night air crisp and invigorating. You did great, she whispered, her voice tinged with pride. I couldn't help but feel a surge of gratitude, not just for her support, but for the evening's unexpected normalcy. This new dual life was filled with challenges, each day presenting its own set of complexities and discoveries. Yet, with each step forward, each event attended, I was not only exploring the facets of my identity, but also weaving them into the fabric of my daily existence. The journey was not without its fears and doubts, but it was a journey I was no longer taking alone. Annie's presence, her unwavering support, gave me the strength to face each new day, each new event, with a growing sense of confidence and self-acceptance. As days turned into weeks, the initial thrill of discovery and the warmth of acceptance gave way to a deeper, more persistent questioning. The dual life I was leading, one where I moved fluidly between my roles as a son, a boyfriend, a friend, and now, increasingly, as Denise, began to feel less like an exploration and more like a profound quest for my true self. The contrasting experiences of each day, from the supportive environments created by Annie and some close friends, to the subtle, sometimes disapproving glances from others, stitched together a tapestry of emotions that was both vibrant and unsettling. With each outing, each interaction, I felt the edges of my identity being drawn and redrawn, a continuous shaping of who I was and who I might become. In quieter moments, often late at night in the solitude of my room, I found myself wrestling with questions that seemed to have no clear answers. Who am I really? Is Denise merely a part of me I had long ignored, or a persona I had adopted under the influence of circumstances? These questions swirled through my mind, each one a wave crashing against the shore of my understanding. I recall one evening, sitting by my window, watching the twilight deepen. The sky was a canvas of oranges and purples, beautiful yet fleeting. It struck me then how much that sky mirrored my own experience, the transient nature of identity, how it could change with the time of day or the weather of one's heart. Feeling increasingly isolated in my thoughts, I turned to Annie for support. She listened as I poured out my fears and doubts, her eyes filled with empathy. It's okay to not have all the answers, she said gently. What you're going through. It's about finding out what fits and what doesn't, like trying on clothes, except these are pieces of who you are. Her words were comforting, but the journey was mine to travel, and it was a path strewn with hurdles of self-doubt and confusion. At social events, I would often find myself floating between groups, neither fully engaged nor completely detached, 
feeling like an imposter in both of my identities. The crisis reached its peak one Sunday at church. As I sat in the pew, dressed in a way that had started to feel more natural, I listened to the sermon about being true to oneself, about the virtues of authenticity. The preacher's words pierced through the fog of my doubts, urging me to look deeper. It was as if he spoke directly to me, challenging me to face the complexities of my identity head on. This call to authenticity prompted a shift within me. I started to seek out more than just acceptance from others. I sought understanding from myself. I spent hours journaling, trying to capture the essence of my feelings, dissecting every thought and emotion linked to my dual existence. I reached out to others who had walked similar paths, their stories and struggles a mirror to my own, offering insights and, more importantly, a sense of shared experience. Gradually, through this introspective process, a clearer picture began to emerge. Denise was not just a role I played. She was a part of me that had been silent for too long. Recognizing this didn't simplify my life, but it enriched it, adding layers of meaning and purpose that I had not anticipated. The internal battle for acceptance and understanding became less about resolving a crisis and more about embracing the fluidity of my identity. I learned that my worth wasn't tied to a single aspect of who I was, but to the whole, complex individual I was becoming. This realization didn't put an end to the challenges, but it provided a foundation of self-assurance to return to whenever the doubts resurfaced. Navigating this dual life taught me that the journey of self-discovery is ongoing, a continuous process of becoming rather than a fixed state of being. And as I moved forward, the weight of the identity crisis began to lift, replaced by a newfound courage to face whatever lay ahead. The school dance, looming at the end of the semester, became the focal point of my thoughts. It was to be a night of celebration, a marking of another year past, but for me, it represented a crossroads. The decision of how to present myself at the dance, whether as David or Denise, felt monumental, each option loaded with implications for my relationships and my own sense of identity. As the date drew nearer, the pressure mounted. Conversations about outfits and dates filled the hallways, and each mention of the dance tightened the knot in my stomach. I found myself laying awake at night, turning over my options like puzzle pieces that didn't quite fit together. It was Annie who finally broke through my indecision. Sitting in our favorite spot by the river, where the rush of water seemed to drown out the noise of the world, she took my hands in hers. It's not just about the dance, she said, her voice firm yet gentle. It's about you being true to yourself in whatever way feels right. Whatever you choose, I'll be there with you. Her words were a balm, soothing the turmoil inside me. I knew then that I wanted to attend the dance as Denise. It was a decision that felt like stepping into a stream, chilly and shocking at first, but ultimately refreshing and right. The revelation brought a new wave of challenges. I had to confront my family. One evening, gathered in the living room, I shared my decision. The room was heavy with silence after I spoke. My mother's eyes were thoughtful, my father's perplexed. It was my sister who broke the silence. I think Denise should go to the dance, she said, a supportive smile breaking through her initial surprise. Denise is part of who you are, and we love you, all of you. Their acceptance wasn't without its complexities. There were fears and concerns, questions about what others would say or think. But the underlying current of love and support was unmistakable. We talked long into the night about fears, hopes, and the many shades of identity. The night of the dance arrived, a culmination of all the steps, both literal and metaphorical, that I had taken. Dressed in a simple, elegant gown, with Annie by my side, I felt a mix of nerves and exhilaration. Walking into the decorated gym, the murmur of music and conversation swelling around us, I felt seen, truly seen for perhaps the first time. There were stares, some whispers and pointed fingers, but they were buffered by the presence of friends and the undeniable fact of my own authenticity shining through. Annie, radiant in her support and pride, danced with me under the swirling lights, our laughter mingling with the music. 
the climax of the evening was not marked by a grand confrontation or a dramatic revelation, but by a slow-building sense of belonging. My peers, witnessing my courage, responded with an acceptance that echoed that of my family. The night turned into a celebration not just of the end of the year, but of the triumph of self-expression and acceptance. In the weeks that followed, the resolution of my journey began to take shape. Conversations with my family grew deeper, more open. We explored the nuances of identity and acceptance together, strengthening our bonds. School became a place where I could be myself, in all the complexities that entailed. Looking back, the dance was a turning point, a step into a world where I was no longer defined by the expectations of others, but by my own understanding of who I am. It was the moment I realized that my journey was not just about finding acceptance from others, but about accepting myself in all my facets. This acceptance became the foundation upon which I could build a future, one where I was free to explore, express, and exist as my truest self, supported by the love and understanding of those around me. As the seasons changed, so did the landscape of my life. The events of the past year, marked by moments of vulnerability and victory, had sculpted a new horizon. Reflecting on this journey, I found myself sitting often in the quiet solitude of early mornings, watching the sunrise paint the sky with colors of promise. My understanding of identity had deepened, transformed from a source of conflict to a wellspring of strength. Identity, I had learned, was not a static state, but a fluid expression of the soul's complex facets. Like the sky's ever-changing hues, it was something beautiful, ever-shifting, and inherently mine. The acceptance and support of my family had been pivotal. Post-dance, our home had become a sanctuary of open dialogue and shared experiences. Conversations that once felt like minefields were now explorations of understanding. My parents, initially bewildered by the paths I traversed, began to see the fabric of my experiences as integral to the tapestry of my growth. They learned, as I did, that love is not conditional upon understanding every nuance of a person, but it certainly grows deeper with understanding. My sister, ever my staunch ally, engaged with me in planning future events and outfits, each session a testament to our strengthened bond. Our laughter, once cautious, now filled the home with its resonance, a sound as comforting as it was liberating. Annie and I continued to explore the world together, our relationship a portrait of evolving love. Her support had been a catalyst for much of my growth, and together we navigated the complexities of our individual journeys, celebrating each step of our mutual understanding and acceptance. School became less about survival and more about living authentically. My peers, who had witnessed my transformation, interacted with me with a new kind of respect, a recognition of my courage that I had never anticipated but deeply appreciated. Friendships were forged and deepened, built on the foundations of genuine interactions and mutual respect. Reflecting on all this, I realized that growth is often like the dawn. It does not arrive with a sudden burst of light but unfolds gradually, its full brightness revealing new details of the landscape that were hidden in the shadows of night. My journey of self-discovery was not just about revealing Denise to the world, it was about uncovering the deeper truths of my being to myself. In this newfound clarity, I found a purpose that transcended my own experiences. I began to advocate for understanding and inclusivity, sharing my story with others who might be treading their paths of discovery. Each story shared, each listener's empathy, added threads to the broader tapestry of communal understanding. As I look to the future, I do so with a heart full of gratitude for the trials and triumphs that have shaped me. The path I walk is paved with the love of those who have walked with me, and the horizon ahead promises not just another day, but a continuation of a journey marked by the ever-expanding light of self-discovery and acceptance. My story, like all stories, is ongoing, a narrative of evolving identity that seeks not a destination, but a deeper understanding of the world within and around me.